1 Samuel chapter 18. Of course, this is right after uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, which involves the, uh, the, ba the battle of David and Goliath. And really what we see, first of all, is uh, I think there's a lot of, we could say about in this chapter about the concept of loyalty, of being loyal to a person. And we see right out of the gate in verse 1, John, you know, in these, in these following verses, but Jonathan's loyalty to David and his future leadership. You say, why is it in verse 1 that you see Jonathan, you know, taking off his robe and his girdle and giving David his sword, giving him his bow? Why is he doing all this? It's because David, or excuse me, Jonathan understood who was going to be king eventually. And they make this covenant here. But it just goes to show you that Jonathan, you know, his loyalty was with the man of God, even above his own father. It says in verse 1, it came to pass when he came to make an end of speaking unto Saul that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Now, now why is that? Why is it that his, he was so knit, his soul was knit with him, that he loved him as his own soul? <clears throat> well, really, it's because they were united in the same cause. If you recall, this, of course, is talking about, you know, right after the defeat of the Philistines, Saul, Jonathan sees this take place. You know, David goes out and, and wins this great victory, you know, goes out in faith, you know, is fighting the Lord's battle, you know, and rallies the troops. And Jonathan sees that, and he's moved and says, that's the kind of person that I want to be associated with. That's the type of person that, that I want to have as my king. It caught, that action caused him to love him. You know, that caught, that's why they were, he loved him as his own soul. It's because of what David was standing for when he went out and fought him. And, of course, when you love somebody, you know, uh, you're going to be loyal to that person. You know, you're going you're gonna to show loyalty to that person. So Jonathan, you know, he's moved by David's, his zeal, his faith. You know, it causes him to love him. His soul is knit unto him. And, but that doesn't end there. He doesn't just say, well, you know, yeah, I love it. I really appreciate you fighting the Lord's battles and everything. I really appreciate you going out and taking on the Philistine. But that's where it ends with me and you. You know, my dad's still going to be king. And, I, you know, I'm next in line to the throne. And that's the way it's going to be, buddy. No, Jonathan, he was, so, he, he, was, he was united in the same purpose as with David. They both had the same purpose. And that's why his, he not only was, you know, loved him, but that he was also very loyal to him. To the point where he you know, just makes this open display of giving him all of these things. I mean, don't you think people are going to recognize Jonathan's robe? Don't you think people are going to recognize, hey, that's Jonathan's sword. Where'd you get that? That's Jonathan's bow. That's his girdle. What are you doing with Jonathan's garments? Say, well, he gave them to me. And what that was, was, you know, it was symbolic. It was him showing, I'm on David's side. You know, I'm all for him taking the throne. Why? Because I love what he stands for. I love the fight that's in him. I love the fact that he's faithful to God and I want to stand alongside him. And he was united in the same purpose. He wasn't just trying to, you know, get the glory for himself. He wasn't obsessed with just getting that position of being king, of following in his father's footsteps. He was more concerned with God receiving the glory. That was the cause that they were united in David and Jonathan, the glory of God. And to Jonathan, it didn't really matter who was king. You know, as long as it was a man of God, that's, that's all that mattered to him, that, that God was going to be glorified. That's what mattered most to him. <clears throat> you know, they had the same spirit, the same attitude, they had the same amount of faith, Jonathan and David. If you remember Jonathan chapter 14 when he went out and he started, he's the one who kind of started the war with the Philistines, if you remember when he preached that chapter. And what did he say to his armor bearer? There is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by few. And he's going out there like, hey, let's just go start a war, me and the armor bearer. That same, you know, it was just like David stepped out and said, I'm going to go fight this Philistine. And everyone would look at that, humanly speaking, and say, that's, that's insane, what are you doing? That doesn't make any sense. But they both had the same spirit of faith. And that's why they were knit together. Their souls were knit and that they loved one another. Because they have both had the same end in mind. The glory of God. If you would, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. We'll be in 1 Corinthians a couple times tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, Jonathan was, you know, he was, yes, he loved him, but there was loyalty there. He was not only, not only did he love the man of God, but he actually was loyal to him. I mean, what good is it to sell, tell somebody, hey, I love you, I'm with you, I'm on your side, and then when the rubber hits the road, you just, you know, you turn tail and run. Amen. That's just a bunch of, it's just talk at that point. Right. You know, and talk is cheap. It's when the, you know, when things get tough, when things get hard, when there really is contention, that's when loyalty has to, that's what matters is, is loyalty. And you can say, oh, I'm loyal, I'm loyal, I'm loyal, but we won't ever know until that loyal, loyalty is tested. Right. And that was, I mean, you can't say that Jonathan's loyalty wasn't tested, because it was. 
I mean, we see, like, I'm kind of getting my head itself in the story, but in later chapters, you know, I mean, even, even his dad's getting upset and saying, don't you understand that the kingdom is going to be given to him? But Jonathan says, I'm fine with that because I'm loyal to him. And we, why? Because we both have the same end in mind toward God. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verse 15. He said, For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have gotten you through the gospel. You know, there's something to be said about the person who got you saved. You know, I, I got saved, you know, many years before I even heard of the new IFB or Pastor Anderson or Faith Word or any of that. I got saved, you know, almost 20 years ago. And I don't know the guy's name that, that, that took me through. You know, I know he had a family. I watched him get up and come down the aisle where I was sitting at the altar. You know, I can tell, which sometimes I wonder, I wish that guy could see, you know, what happened because of that day, where my life went. You know, I think about that as for us as soul winners many times too. You know, sometimes we just go out and we're just knocking doors and just doing what we're supposed to do. We get somebody saved and, you know, we might never see hide or hair of that person again. But you don't know. I mean, only heaven's going to tell sometimes the, 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 the many you know, things that happen after you led somebody to the Lord. Now, am I going to say every person goes on to be, you know, just set the world on fire for Christ? No, probably not. But I guarantee you, if you go out soul winning and you're getting people saved, you're going to get to heaven and probably hear some pretty cool stories. Oh. Like I say, I remember that day, that day you came and told, gave me the gospel. You know, and a few years later, I was living in another city, another town, whatever. Who knows, right? Said, father in Christ, someone who you know is a, is a spiritual guide and leader to you, kind of like with many people, you know, the testimony that I've heard over and over again is how Pastor Anderson, you know, they got saved through his preaching, and people, you know, right, and they'll even express that affectionately with love. But my question is often these same people is where's the loyalty? And sometimes it's those same people. I'm not saying everybody. In fact, the vast majority of people aren't this way. But it's like those same people, when things get tough, they, they turn. They, they don't have any loyalty. And so what's it worth? What, what, oh, you know, he's the one that led me to Christ. He's my father. In Christ. It means nothing. I love him. It means nothing. Loyalty is what matters. And there's nothing wrong. People don't even preach like this, bring up that. I think there's just something in, in man and his pride to say, well, I'm not following any man. I'm not going to be loyal to some man. I'm loyal to Christ. No, no, no. Man. Why do you think he was loyal to David? Because he was loyal. This is God's will. God is the one who anointed him. God lifts one up and puts another one down. And he, and he said, I'm not going to be found you know, I'm not going to be found to fight against God. You know, I'm loyal to God. So if David's the man, then he's the man. And he went along with it. <clears throat> and we'll look at verse 16 in 1 Corinthians 4. Paul says, Wherefore I beseech you. Well, I don't follow anybody. Paul's beseeching. He's begging followers of me. Twitter account. You know, and you hit that button over there. Or subscribe or whatever. He's saying, follow me. And what? In a sense, do live the way that I live. Do what I do. Follow my example. He's beseeching them. So it sounds to me like, you know, following a man of God, you know, being loyal is an important thing in Scripture. Oh, it's very important. Amen. And we'll go over to Ephesians chapter 4. Keep something in 1 Corinthians 4, but go over to Ephesians chapter 4. You know, Jonathan here, he, he saw the same faith in David that he saw in himself love him and that caused him moreover to be loyal to him and there's nothing wrong with being loyal to be to somebody You're saying yeah i follow that person i follow that man of god i mean when we when we say our children rules for following their parents i follow my dad i follow the leading and instruction of my mother oh you just you're you, you don't know how to think critically you need to get outside the box you know no that, that, that's exactly what the bible is telling us to do to follow you know, our, our, you know, whether it's parents, you know, leading their children, children following their parents. Well, how about, you know, us following our spiritual elders? We should do that as well and be, and, and be loyal. Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. And that's, 
that's the you know that's the important that's what uh, that's the crux of it right now. preaching blind loyalty and people whenever you they, they think that's what you mean by being loyal right that it just you know the, the man of God can do no wrong look we know that the men of God you know they fail parents are going to fail us to some degree or another men of God are going to disqualify themselves from time to time they're going to do things they shouldn't do they're going to be disappointments and at that point we stop following them because we follow them as they follow Christ. Right. And they're there. What shows us that they're there to lead us. That they're there to show us how to fight these battles. How to lead God's people. That like David. David went out before. Went in, came in and went out before the people. He was leading them. And that's why. Well look. When, you fall, when you're going to be loyal. Why, why is it important to have loyalty. In the local church. Because that's what leads to unity. You've got to have unity in the local church. It's very important. The Bible says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, it's a good thing to have unity in a local church. You don't believe me? Go find a church that doesn't have unity. Go find some church, you know, that's, you know, got some deacon board that votes on and see how much you You know, they start voting on things like what color the carpet's going to be. What style of chair we're going to get? What are we going to paint the walls? What are we going to do? You know, what's, they start voting on it, and then you get all these factions of, are we going to do soul winning or are we not going to do soul winning? You know, go join a church like that, and you'll see how important loyalty is and, and unity is to getting something done for God. That's why it's a good thing. But look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the spirit of the unity and the bond of peace. There is one body and one faith, one spirit. Even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Jump down to verse 11. You say, well, it sounds like you know that's all pretty important. Like there's only one faith, there's one baptism, there's one Lord. Saying, you know, we need to have mind, we need to esteem others better than ourselves, and love. But verse 11, and he gave some apostles and some prophets. These are the people that are going to help you do that. These are the people that help you achieve things that he just mentioned the lowliness of mind, the meekness, the love, the unity. You know, he gives us people to help us achieve that. Because often, you know, if we're just left to ourselves, leave your kids alone. For 20 minutes and see how much unity there is. Right. <laughs> you know how many times you got to reunify the kids throughout the day? You stop that. You be nice. Quit pushing. Give that back. Play nice. Right? And I'm not saying that in a condescending way. I'm just saying, I'm just using an example because of the fact that that's human nature. Right, yeah. You know, and that's not, we like to think we grow out of that. <laughs> but when you get a group of people together, you know, people have different personalities, different preferences. People, you know, can get to get along better with other people, better than others, you know, and you can have, you know, start to drive a wedge between people. And the room has to be best friends, but you know what we have to be? We have to be united in our purpose. Right. Because there's only one Lord, there's only one faith, there's only one baptism. So we need to be united in our purpose. And that's why it says in verse 11 that he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and the perfect man. Look, it sounds like those people are pretty important. It sounds like the people that are filling that role in your life have some value. Because they're actually going to be the ones that help keep the body together, pointed in the right direction, and help to glorify itself bring glory to God. And again, that's the purpose, isn't it? The glory of God. But often what you'll see is even among, you know, these people, leadership, what you'll sometimes find is people, they start to put leaders above one another, right? They start to, they start to prefer people's personalities. They have preferences, right? Like some people, hey, I really like this person's preaching. I really like this person's preaching. Maybe they're from that area. Or maybe they they share something in common with that. That's perfectly natural, but you know sometimes people will start comparing themselves among themselves, and the Bible says that is not wise. 
In fact, it's a very carnal thing to do. If you are, if you're still in 1 Corinthians 3, a familiar, a familiar passage, 1 Corinthians 3, look at verse 3, it says, For you, are you not For whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? Look, if there's contention, if there's division, if there's strife in a church, it's because of carnality. By pride cometh contention. So when you have a church that's got this division in it, where there's no unity there, I, guarantee, I can guarantee you one thing. There's carnal people in that church. And he says, For while one saith, I am of Paul, another, I am of Apollos, are you not yet carnal? Again, he's not, you know, there's nothing wrong. You know, I like this, this, this person's preaching maybe more than another person's preaching. That's fine. But to have a division where you say, well, I'm just going to follow him, this person only, and nobody else. You know, only, only Pastor Anderson can baptize me. You know, I'll, 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 you know, I live here in Tucson and I'll come to church when Pastor Anderson's there. And look, I, I don't bring Pastor Anderson and, and preachers like him and, and, you know, Pastor Mejia and others. I don't bring them out here to make me look good. Because <laughs> that's not how it works. <laughs> you know, they preach some great sermon, they leave, and everybody else is kind of like, hmm. <laughs> how far is L.A. from here? <laughs> Phoenix is close. Right? But you look, if they example of being carnal, right? Someone saying, well, I'm only going to listen to so-and-so. You know, there's other guys, they can't teach me anything. That's carnality. Preferring, you know, another person. Another. And you think that's what Paul and Apollos had around? Counting their followers? How many you got? Comparing their subscribers on YouTube or something? No. Because they were united in purpose. They didn't, they, to sit there and prefer per personality over purpose is carnal. That's why it says in verse 5, who then is Paul? And you'll see this exact same attitude out of David later in the chapter. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believe. Look, we just he's saying, look, all we did was our job. We just went out and preached the gospel and you got saved. It's the, it, the gospel is the power of God. It's the Lord that should glorify, not us. We're just men that preached. Even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. So then neither he that is planted is anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. If you would, go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Focus on the purpose more than the personality of somebody. You know, I think people would be more loyal. I think people, there'd be more unity if people could focus on the purpose over the personality of a person. Not get caught up in a personality. Because you know what? You, people are going to disappoint you. And that's the day, you know that saying, never meet your heroes? There's a grain of truth in that. Because you know, you in your mind, you built them up into something and you meet them and you find they're just like everybody else. Yeah, right. Then you get to know them a little bit better and you find out there's something about them you don't like. <laughs> if, all you're fi if all you're following is a personality, you're, you know, you're not going to make it. All right. You're going to fall away. True. What you need to do is, yeah, it's great to have a personality. Look at that person. <laughs> it's great to look at somebody and say, I admire their personality, who they are as a person. But if you know what you really should admire is their purpose, what they stand for. Yeah. Like Jonathan did with David. <clears throat> if you're there in 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 1. Well, let me remind you of 2 Timothy 3. You don't have to turn there. But what Paul is telling Timothy, he says to him, but thou hast fully known my doctrine. Look, it's good to know, you know, a person's doctrine. If someone's teaching good doctrine, we like to we like to sink our teeth into that. Say, man, this is good, right? Thou hast known my doctrine, my manner of life. You know, we could follow them as they follow Christ. We could pattern our lives after their lives if they're following Christ. He says, Thou hast known my fully known my doctrine, manner of life, and what? My purpose. You know what I stand for. You know what I'm about, Timothy, is what he's trying to tell him here. And look, that's something we have to wrap our minds with. That's something we got to get a hold of. It's what's the purpose of the people? What is, what is driving them? We need to make that our own. Because when those people let us down, when those people you know, hurt us or disappoint us in some way, we're going to still carry through. Those people, and look, I can tell you about people in my past 
that were fathers in Christ to me that are completely out of the ministry today. Preachers that were preaching sermons that were very formative and influential in my life that have fallen out of the church completely. That, that are just as backslidden as you can be. And got up and were preaching sermons that moved me and that inspired me. And look, if all I was clinging to was a personality, that could have destroyed me. That could destroy you. All you're clinging on to is just, well, he's Paul. Well, he's Apollos. What's their manner of life? Make that your own, and when those people disappoint you, you can still continue. Why? Because you still have the same purpose. And maybe even be an example to them in the long run. <clears throat> but here, what are we talking about tonight? We're talking about putting a people's, you know, putting purpose, putting a person's purpose before their personality. You know, put their purpose before their personality. You know, and being loyal, being loyal to these people, because they're important. And loyalty is a characteristic that is to be, you know, there's nothing, I think, I feel like today it's almost like a, it's almost like a knock, you know, it's almost something people say bashfully. Well, I'm loyal to, you know, this pastor. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm loyal to him, you know. Some people, they don't want to, they, it's, it's weird, it's like they feel weird saying that. But I know other people like, well, I'm just loyal to him. And again, it doesn't is that the people you're loyal to, you should get a lot of slack. You should, you should cut them some slack. Give them a lot of rope. That's what loyalty does. You know, it gives them the benefit of the doubt. It doesn't just jump on the attack bandwagon as soon as it comes rolling through town. That's not loyalty. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Look, loyalty is something we should have, and it's something that's praiseworthy in a person. And I'm thinking of people right now that I've demonstrated loyalty over the years to, to people that I'm loyal to. And I, and I just, I love those people. Those people are dear to me. Those are the people that I want in my corner. Look, he says in verse 1, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus and the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace be unto you Christ. We give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience, of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and the Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. So Paul starts out here expressing, you know, he's kind of showing here how much work they're putting into them. He's saying, look, we, we're remembering you without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. We, we, we give thanks to God always, making, always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. You know, I just, they, 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 they turn on the man. I don't know how many times they spent. If, 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 if the amount of time they spent on YouTube making stupid comments wherever, on social media, attacking him, I wonder if they spent that much time in praying how different their attitude would be towards the man of God, towards somebody that, you know, has done so much for them. I mean, that's what Paul's saying. Look, we may mention even our prayers. They're praying for you. We're remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in the sight of God. And he talks about how they came unto him in power and the Holy Ghost and much insurance. And you know what manner of men we were among you among you for your sake. You know, we did, he said, look, we did all these things for your sake. We, what did he do at Thessalonica? They worked with, day and night with travail to make themselves an example to the people there, right? He said, we were working day and night to make ourselves an example unto you. So they, he, look, Paul, it's not a one-way street with what loyalty. You know, Paul, Paul saying, look, we invested in you. We're still investing. We're praying, we're working. We did all this. And look at verse 6. He says, And you became followers of us and of the Lord. You think that was two different actions? He became, well, you know, he said, Well, I'm going to follow Paul, and I'm also going to follow. Is that, what, is that what he's saying there? He's saying, Look, you, you became followers of us and the Lord. Meaning this, that when you decided to follow us, you started following the Lord. Because the Lord gives these people to you to follow. 
And if you follow them, you are, you know, by proxy following the Lord. Right. That gives us the apostles, the, the evangelists, the, the preachers, the pastors, all these people. Why? So that we can learn to follow Christ. It's one action. You're following, and you say you became follower of us and the Lord, and received the word of much affliction of the Holy Ghost. So we see, you know, you know, and I, and I don't understand it sometimes. Some people make it really easy to be loyal to. Some leaders are just, it's just easy. I'm not saying they're, they're, they're perfect, but I'm saying this, they make it real easy to be loyal to them. I don't, I, don't, I mean, I, I think if Paul was around today, I'd probably have a pretty easy time being loyal to a guy like Paul. If I, you know, and, I, and if we knew and understood the things from their, how they've Maybe never, you know, said it to our face. Maybe we don't even see it. But you know, for all we know, there's been, you know, how, how much time is spent in prayer where our name has been brought before the throne of God by some person, some pastor, some leader. So that would be pretty easy, wouldn't it, to be loyal now? To now in this passage is not, you know, loyalty even when maybe that person you're following isn't so nice. <laughs> David's loyal chapter. You know, and we read it, and, and Saul's not doing David any favor. Pretty hard. I mean, it's, it's, it's David, or Saul is just trying to get David out of there. And what's David just keep doing? Being loyal, being loyal, being loyal, all the way through. He's doing him any favors. Are you still there in 1 Samuel and it says, And David went out whithersoever Saul sent him and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the, man of, over the men of war, and he's accepted in the sight of all the people and also in the sight of Saul's servant. Now, this is kind of, I think, a synopsis here of what we're about to read. I don't think Saul did this because, well, you know, David's just worthy of this position. We read on and we find out that Saul set him over the men of war in an attempt to get him destroyed. Put this kid in a position, you know, where there's, where there's a high likelihood that he'll get killed, but maybe I could keep the throne. Which just kind of shows you at this point in the story. But it says there that, you know, Saul, that David behaved himself wisely. I think David knew what Saul was up to. I don't think it's emotion, you know, and just, you know, like didn't have a clue what was really going on. David was a smart guy. David had some wisdom in the Spirit of the Lord. I'm sure he could discern what was taking place here. But what does it say? That, you know, David went along with it, and he succeeded. He remained loyal. He said, if that's what you want, king, that's what I'll do. You want me to go out and fight these battles? So be it. I'll do it. Why? Because I'm loyal to the man of God, even if he's not perfect. Good followers can put up with bad leaders. Good followers can put up with bad leaders. You know, and again, let me just, I, I hate having to put an ass with sins, you know, that would disqualify a leader. You know, there's way too much of that today. You know, some pastor disqualifies a or whatever, you know, take the time to explain all that, but there are certain sins that would get a man disqualified from the pastorate, and people just have you say, oh, that's okay, just stay in that position. That's wrong. Okay, that's not what I'm talking about. But I am saying this, that good followers can put up with bad leaders. Oh, how about this? You know, you could go to a, a, the pre-trip doctrine and succeed there. You know, you could go to an old IMB church that maybe doesn't cross every T and dot every I like we do when it comes to certain doctrines and still go there and learn things. I'm not saying that those are necessarily bad leaders, they're just not perfect. But, you know, newsflash, nobody in the new IFP is either. Right. And, you know, you could go to these other churches with people who maybe you might even say, well, they're not as good. Go blessing and be what? A good follower. I mean, I, and, until it gets to the point where the pastor at some old IFP church is throwing a, a, a javelin at you, you know, you really haven't got anything on David. 
Well, I can't follow my boss at work. Is he such a tyrant? Is he, is he walking around with a spear in his hand ready to chuck it at your head? Because notice, you know, David, it says he did that twice. Yeah, I'm kind of getting my head itself. In verse, uh, verse 11, and David, and Saul cast the javelin for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And he avoided it out of his presence twice. And then he's showing us, he, this happened more than once. We're, we're, you know, which means this, that David went to work one day, had a javelin threw at him, and then came back the next day. And said, well, maybe he was just having a bad day. <laughs> because he's loyal. Is he loyal to the man? Is he loyal to Saul's personality? Saul was just so charming. Look, Saul was probably insane at this point. I mean, he's just paranoid. He's worried. He's vindictive. He's malicious. Not a good guy. So is that why David's loyal to him? Putting up with having javelins thrown at him? Because how charming Saul is? No. He's loyal to what? Not the personality, the purpose. Because they made, you know, they, their motives might have had been different, right? In the story, but their enemy was the same, wasn't it? He's saying, David, I'm going to send him out against the Philistines and see if I can just get him snuffed out, just, you know, get him wrecked. And then the throne is mine. And David's like, oh, you want me to go kill God's enemies? You want me to go smite some more Philistines? Sign me up. I don't care what your motive is. Why? Because we have the same purpose. Taking on the Philistines. He was loyal to that. He was loyal to the cause. He was loyal to the purpose. He was not loyal to the personality. <clears throat> so it just goes to show us that you know good followers can put up with bad leaders. That's a great example of loyalty. Not to a personality, but to the purpose. And I'm, you know, I'm kind of repeating myself a little bit, but... Look, if you're loyal to the purpose, you'll put up with a bad personality. You'll be put up with it when the preacher, you know, rubs you the wrong way or does something. Because you'll say, well, his purpose and my purpose are the same. So you know what? I'm going to go ahead and just, just put up with it. You know, bridge, water under the bridge. <clears throat> now, the other thing I want to point out before. This, the other thing that's in this chapter is that the bad despise the good. The bad despise the good. And if you look there in verse 12, it says, And Saul was afraid of David because the Lord was with him. Was he afraid of David because he was just... You know, Saul walked in the weight room and saw him 100 pounds and said, That guy's scary. No. He saw he was afraid of him because the Lord was with him. <laughs> Therefore Saul re removed him from him and made him captain over a thousand. So that, here again, here's why he would give him that promotion that we read about in the beginning. And he went out and came in before the people, meaning going out to war and coming back in from war. So you can see the motive of Saul here. Look, I'm going to put him over a captain. I'm going to make a captain over a thousand. You know, he's going to have to leave lead the charge and the battle. He's, it's going to be his job to go out and fight these wars, and hopefully that will be the end of David. But you notice he wasn't saying, oh, I'm going to go take him on myself. I wouldn't want to go fight a guy who just took the head off Goliath. I wouldn't do it. And, and the Lord, and, and Saul, rather, he knows he's afraid of David because the Lord was with him and departed from Saul. You can tell when the Lord's not with you. You can tell when you're walking in the flesh. You can tell when you're not filled with the Spirit. You know it. No one has to tell you that. And that's what and Saul knew it. He said, the Lord's departed. I've been getting vexed with this evil spirit from the Lord. And then he sees, you know, has the Spirit. He's fighting battles. He's winning victories. The people love him. They're singing his songs about him. And, and, and Saul... In his carnal, backslidden state, he didn't wasn't like, oh, that's great. You know, he earned it. That's that's wonderful. I, I would try to be more like him. That'd be the come take his power. You know, that he's going to get his position. He became afraid of it, and so he sets him up. The bad despise the good, and this is just the, always the way it is in life. People don't. People who are bad, they don't. They don't like when 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 good people come around 
Because it kind of shines a light on them, doesn't it? It's like it's like turning the light on, and the cockroaches, you know, they hate the light, right? And you know, and David's kind of like an, he's kind of an example of Jesus in this picture, right? Go over to First John chapter three. Despised out of envy, right? Why? For his righteousness, because he's he's being used by God, because God is you know with him, and not with Saul. And he's despised for it. David's being despised for it. Kind of like Jesus was. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Right? He said, the world cannot hate you, but me testify of it that the works thereof of evil are evil. Now, Jesus went around and flat out just said, you're evil. Right? I mean, we've read the passages where he's just calling them hypocrites. You know, you know, calling it you know, the, the whited sepulchers. I mean, he's just flat out saying right to the face, you're evil, you're wicked. And they hated him for it. You know, with David, it's a little different in the fact that maybe he's not flat out just calling Saul wicked to his face. But it's obvious. And it says even in that, you read, if you were with me there, is that even Saul's servants sided with David. Even them, they were like, yeah, they approved of David. They said, this is right. Even Saul's son, throne's yours, buddy. When that's gone, it's all yours. Have my bow, have my sword, have my girdle, have my robe, take it all. It's all yours. And it was obvious that you know Saul was wicked and David was righteous. And without even having to say anything, it became glaringly obvious. You know, David, David, you know, didn't have to say a word. He just was. And what was the result? Saul going, oh, you know, I should just repent. I should just get right with God, you know. No. It was envy and strife and plotting. And commit murder. He's trying to send him out to get killed. First John chapter 3, where you are, it says, verse 11, For this is the message we have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. You know, if Cain, if, if, if Abel's, if Abel had been, his works had been wicked as well. I think Cain would have let him live. It wasn't just the problem wicked, but it was also the fact that Abel was righteous. So mad. <clears throat> so David, he's kind of like a Jesus here. He's being despised for the fact that he is good. He himself is good the good here. Okay, that's one thing I want to kind of close on. Is that, you know, the good, they have compassion for the bad. They're not, you know, Saul, David's not rubbing Saul's nose in it. Motion Saul, I went out, he had me go fight those battles. Guess what? I won. Hmm. What, ne what next? What else? And, you know, there's, you know, this wasn't my I know that we see here with David. I mean, the people are on David's side. He's, he's led this great victory. He's going out. He's been given this promotion. He's fighting these wars. He's winning. They're singing songs. You think David could have just said, I want the throne now. He could have had it. Sure he could have. I mean, God would have probably had something to say about it. But we see other passages. I mean, you see that all throughout the Old Testament where people are taking out one king and putting themselves in. They get a loyalty and they get a following. And then they, they try to, you know, dispose the old leader and just step right into the into the role. Do you think it would have been that hard for David to do that at this point in the story? No. For him to just say, now, buddy, beat it. But that's not what he did. He was patient. Why? Because his works were righteous. He was willing to just be loyal to a bad leader. Somebody who wasn't perfect. <clears throat> The good have compassion for the bad. In the story, as we read through 1 Samuel, but you just see the compassion that David has for Saul. And he, I really think David just felt bad for the guy. And just was heartbroken for him. And that's why so many times when he was given an opportunity to, to take the throne or kill Saul, he wouldn't do it. He said, I will not touch the Lord's anointing. at any time but he didn't you know and that kind of reminds me of us 
You know, I feel like sometimes we get a little impatient with the world, don't we? We just want to just push that button and just, you know, make everything, just nuke everybody that's wicked and just <laughs> roll into the brain of Christ. That's not the way it's going to be, though. We're going to have to be like David. We're going to have to wander in that wilderness for a while. You're going to have somebody on your tail trying to do you evil. You know, the world is going to way through this life. You know, David, he he, bought, he had to bide his time until the throne came to him, didn't he? He had to go through some, some trials. It's the same way with us. The rule and reign with Christ, we're going to be exalted with the Lord. And I talked about the Sunday morning in that sermon. I'm not going to re-preach that. But the Lord will exalt us over the world in time. But, you know, if we try and go out and do that today. But what can we do in the meantime? What can you do in the meantime? Be loyal. Be loyal. Be loyal to Christ. How are you going to do that? By following the people that God has put in your life to lead you. Right? Be loyal to them. Because if you follow them, you follow Christ. Let's just read through real quick and we'll, and we'll wrap up here in verse 14. It says in verse 14, And David behaved himself wisely in all, all his ways, the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, because he went out and came in before them. And Saul said to David, Behold my daughter Mirab, her will I give thee to wife, only to the Lord's battles. That's a funny thing that he says to him right there. Hey, I'll give you my daughter to wife, but you just got to do something for me. Well, what is it? Be thou valiant for me and fight the Lord's battles. I mean, what do you think? I mean, what would have been your response? What do you think I've been doing, buddy? <laughs> hey, I got this this giant here. I don't know if you've noticed it. Do I need to remind you what I've been up to? It's such a duh statement. Duh. Fight the Lord's battles. Duh. That's what I've been doing. Right. But is that was that? Where, where David went with it. And David said unto Saul, Who am I? And what is my life for my father's family in Israel that I should be son in law to the king? And that's his humility coming through. And you know, that's just something that's just all through the Bible. Anytime you see anybody that does something great for God, you know what there is? Humility. There's always humility. You just, you can't, you can't humility. And, he, and David said unto Saul, Who am I, what is my life, or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it came to pass at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given unto Adriel, the Meholathite, to wife. So he kind of said, you know, that was kind of a psych move, right? Psych. And Michael loved David, so, you know, it actually worked out for the better. You know, you know maybe, maybe, uh, Saul was trying something here, like, well, you know, I was going to give you a wife, but now I'm not. But, you know, he might end up marrying somebody that he didn't love. Right? So that's kind of the same in that passage. Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. And Saul said, I will give him her. So in love with them. Because they make such a good, cute couple. It's such a nice match. Is that why? I mean, this shows you the character of Saul. I mean, for David to say, who am I that I should be son-in-law of the king? You know, is a, it's profoundly humble because you start to get, you get it. By this point, you should know what kind of person Saul's become. It's not, not I mean, he'd be like, oh, you're son-in-law to Saul? Rough. Talking about a bad in-law, right? I mean, look at what this guy, look at Saul's mentality here. It's all said, I will give her him to her that she may be a snare to him. He's, he's just trying to use her, his own daughter, as a snare. To use his own child to be vindictive towards somebody else. And look, that, thing, that kind of thing is still out there today. Out there today, people will use their own children in a way like this. And, and, and try, to, to, to try to do bad to other people. It, it sounds crazy, right? It sounds like, what? It's out there. It's in Scripture. It's right here. 
his own daughter. I'm going to use her to be a wicked guy. You know, that's not loving your children. Wherefore Saul, uh, and Saul said, I will give him her that she be a snare to him, verse 21, and the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Wherefore Saul said to David, Thou, uh, thou shalt this day be my son-in-law and one of the twain. And Saul commanded his servant, saying, Can you know David secretly? And say, Behold, he hath delight. And he's saying, basically saying, Go lie for me. Tell a lie. We know that. And all his servants love thee. Now therefore, be the king's son-in-law. And Saul's servants spake these words in the ears of David. A light thing to be a king's son-in-law, seeing I am a poor man and lightly esteemed. So he says the same thing again that he said when you know the first daughter was offered. You know, who am I? You know, this is this is a big deal. And I'm a nobody, right? And he wasn't just saying that to Saul to try and sound humble. This is how David really felt, because now he's just saying it to his servant. servants of Saul told him, saying, On this manner spake David, and Saul said, Thus shall you say to David, The king desireth not any dowry. He says, Don't worry about being poor. Don't worry about that. I don't need any money. But in hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemy. That's kind of a strange dowry. I'm, I'm, I'm serious. I mean, I'm putting, I'm putting time and money. My wife's going through everything she's going with, raising these kids. I turn out a good, godly young lady that I'm just going to hand over to some guy. I might, I'm, you know, I'm going to go down the altar and, and give her away, but, you know, I'm going to get it something back. <laughs> it ain't going to be this, <laughs> you know, but I'm going to get something. Probably a side of grass-fed beef. <laughs> I'm not kidding either. I shouldn't say that all the little boys are just like. Well, <laughs> and those wrestling girls are going to do it for me. All the dads are like, we ain't got that kind of money, son. <laughs> Find another one. There's other fish in the sea. <laughs> but he says, look, go go, get the, the hundred foreskins of the Philistines that I might be avenged of my enemies. And you know what? David does it. That's his loyalty coming through again, his humility. Oh, okay. He knew what, and he knew what what Saul was trying to pull. Oh, you're just trying to set me up for another fall, huh? But see, David had the confidence that he was gonna. You know, is that what you want? He's already cut off the Goliath's head. I mean, he went out with a with a with a sling and a stone and fell the best, the biggest, baddest dude there was. What's a few hundred first kids to him? What else you got, Saul? And here's the thing, when you have, what, what is that? That's David's confidence. You know, when you, when you go through those battles, those big battles, and you have the victory, and you come out on the other side victorious, you know, you can just walk right into these other ones. Say, what else you got, devil? And he said, he looked, and I'll do it. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. And the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went with and, and his men and slew the Philistines two hundred men and brought their for, brought their foreskins and gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be if the king's son-in-law. I mean, can you imagine being Saul at that point? You know, just spoiled again, just trying to set him up as captive of thousands, send him out to war, see if we can't get him snuffed out, see if we can't get him killed, send him on this ridiculously sounding mission. See if that'll get him killed. And every time David just comes back. Anything else, sir? Anything else you'd like, Your Majesty? <clears throat> that must have been so frustrating to him. <clears throat> and Saul gave him Michael to uh, his daughter to wife. So he had to follow through. He's like, well, that didn't turn out the way I wanted. But here you go, David. And Saul saw and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. I just love that. That Saul's just spending this whole chapter just conspiring against David. And it all just turns on its head at the end. And Saul just saying, God's with him. There's nothing I can do. And not only that, he's got my daughter for his wife and she loves him. And he's trying, you know what? He meant it all for evil, but God worked it to good. Oh, 
You know, and if God be for us, who can be against us? That's the message that the scripture is showing us here. That, you know, if Christ is on our side, you know, nobody can resist us. And God will work all those, those situations out that seem to be so dire to our benefit. You know, that's why David was able to say, Paris, a table in the midst of mine enemies. He said, I'm sitting in the middle of a battlefield, and God says, Don't worry, son, I got this. Just sit down and have a meal. There's nothing. Look, God can't, or, or, or the enemies of, of God's people, they can't touch him. They can conspire, and they can try crazy ideas of how they're going to, you know, wipe him out, but they can't touch him. And it turns out better. You know, the Philistines are dead. At least I hope they are. They're, of course they are. They're dead. <laughs> crude joke. He's got the he's got the blushing bride that loves him. He's got the position. Everything worked out for good. These are the kind of like the little lessons that God's giving David because we all know what lies ahead. This isn't the worst that David's going to go through. You know, David's literally going to be running for his life at one point and being pursued by the king and his army. And Saul, and Saul became David's enemy. And why? Because David was such a bad guy? No. Because his, his words weren't. Saul was, has become very wicked. He went forth and it came to pass after they went forth that David behaved himself more wisely than all those so that his name was much set by you know, and that phrase just comes up over and over in this passage that what did David do? Behave himself wisely, behave himself more wisely, behave himself very wisely. That's something that we need to do today. Because look, you know, we might not have a, a, you know, a bad dude like Saul in our life, but we have an enemy in this life. You know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. World. You know, we have spiritual enemies us evil. And we need to walk through this world wisely. First Corinthians. Walk circumspectly redeeming the time because you know the days are evil. You know what that circumspect or circumference circumspectly means being vigilant, having your eyes open, looking around and not just being asleep at the wheel as you go through life. Be like David. Be wise. That's what, you know, I believe that's what's talking about here when David says that he's behaving wisely. Is that he's seeing saying, Saul's not trying to do me good. He's trying to do me evil. You know, trusting in the Lord. And, and what happens in the end is that he's blessed. But you know what? Why he was, I believe a big part of why he was blessed is because the fact that he was loyal. You know, he was loyal to a bad leader because he was united not to his personality. You know, and in return, not only did he have all these blessings, the, the daughter-in-law, the position, the victories, so on and so forth, but he also inspired that in other people. He also had other people loyal to him, like Jonathan, which is a big deal. It's a big deal when the king's son is saying, I don't want the throne, it's yours. You know, he got that loyalty. And, you know, if, if we're loyal to other people, you know, you want people to be loyal to you. You want people to, to back you up and stand behind you. You need to do the same thing. It's a two-way street. You know, I'll never... I remember a uh, pastor saying this once, and it's, it just rings... It's, I think about it time to time. You know, before... You, you're, I hope that some of you that become pastors have followers just like you. I went, ooh. <laughs> it was a heart check. I had to say, would I want church members like me if I were the pastor? You know, and that's something we all had to think about. And you know, some of us. But what if we were? You know, would we say I would be happy with the type of church member I am? And you know, and you know what goes a long way with with pastors and leaders is loyalty, not perfection. That's unrealistic to expect that the will be perfect. Just be loyal. There are trials, there are struggles. When the, when the enemy is attacking, that we don't, you know, that we're loyal. That's, that's really it. And if we do that, you know, God will bless us. God's going to see us through, just like he did with David. 
David was loyal to a bad leader, an imperfect person, and God just carried him through and blessed him along the way. That's my message tonight. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord,